يقول راجع فوي رب سامعي محمد بن الجزاري الشافعي الحمد لله وصلى الله على نبيه ومصطفاه محمد وآله وصحبه ومقرئ القرآن مع محبه وبعد إن هذه مقدمة فيما على قارئه أن يعلمه إذ واجب عليهم محتم قبل الشروع أولا أن يعلموا ما خارج الحروف والصفات ليلفظوا بأفصاح اللغات محرر التجويد والمواقف وما الذي رسم في المصاحف Continue by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings in explaining Manzumat al Muqaddima fi ma yajbu ala qari al Quran al Yalama, min nazm imam al Hufaz wa Hujjat al Fadda, Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Yusuf ibn al Jazari, Rahimah Allah ta'ala, wa radiya anhu wa raka ala rakati, wa nifa'ana bihi. We are still in section 4, or Babu Tajweed. والأخذ بالتجويد حتم لازم من لم يصحح القرآن آثم and we said there's another we said this narration من لم يصحح it's found in one of the manuscripts I showed you the manuscripts last time that was dictated by Imam Ibn Jazari رحمه الله and approved by him من لم يصحح القرآن آثم لأنه به الإله أنزل وهكذا منه إلينا وصل وهو أيضا حرية التلاوة وزينة الأداء والقراءة وهو إعطاء الحروف حقها من كل صفة ومستحقها ورد كل واحد لأصله واللفظ في نظيره كمثله مكملا من غير ما تكلف باللطف في النطق بلا تعسف وليس بينه وبين تركه إلا رياضة امرئ بفكه So that, what, that is the section which is number four. Obviously, we're going into some of the sciences of the Quran, topics, and that's very important for you. We're not going to go into a lot of details. We're not going to cover all the sciences of, of the Quran, but we have to cover these topics that are related to the preservation of the Quran and whether the, the, the oral preservation or the, the written preservation right as we mentioned we have two two types of transmission of the Quran the oral and the and the written which is which is the main rely on which is the main reliance the oral right Bec and because uh, throughout the time of the Prophet وسلم, they do not have copies of the Qur'an and reading from them and memorizing, right? Some of them had, by the way, huh? You remember we mentioned that. It's called Masahif al Masahif Sahaba al khasa The personal Sahaba Masahif, the personal copies of the Qur'an of the Sahaba. Of course, some of the, uh, like their own copies, and very few copies, those who used to write, right? And they might not have the whole Qur'an in their copies. And their copies are mixed with like some tafsir, some additions. For example, one of the ayat Allah says, uh, you should fast if you break the oath, or then you should fast three days. One of the sahaba, maybe, maybe he wrote next to it, consecutive, mutatabi'at. So, and this is why we will see when Sayyidina Uthman عنه, compiles the Qur'an or copies the Qur'an to be more precise, he asks all the Sahaba to burn their own personal copies of the Qur'an so that nothing mixes with, with the Qur'an. Suppose Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Saud, for example, who had his own Mus'haf and he added some tafsir to his Qur'an and he passes away, then his children will come and say, oh, this is our father's Qur'an. You see, he's, he wrote this word here, so it's Qur'an. So they would so to, to put away any possibility of mixing the Qur'an with other things, Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu, as we will see inshallah, he asked all the Sahaba to burn their own copies 
and he made a committee and they standard, standardized the Quran and made uh, official copies that everyone who wants to make a copy you have to come and make copy from this master copy and that is one of the greatest deeds that Sayyidina Uthman did until now when we make some nasheed or when we talk about Sayyidina Uthman we say Jami' al-Qur'an we say Jami' al-Qur'an okay uh, so we talked about the first compilation of the Holy Quran, which is in the time of who? Sayyiduna Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. If you want to be like more scholarly, speaking more scholarly, in a more scholarly way, we can say the first compilation was in the time of the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In what sense? The first sense that he compiled it, means he memorized it, and many of the Sahaba memorized all of the Qur'an. That has to be very well known, guys, and very well understood. A huge number of the Sahaba, who can give me just two, one example of that there was a big number of the Sahaba who memorized the entire Qur'an. The incident of the Seventy Qurra who passed away or who were killed when in the battle of Ma'una, the battle of the well, not the battle, it's not a battle, they betrayed him, right? They asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, send us some of your companions so that they teach us Quran, then they betrayed him and they killed him. It was a big treason, a, a very ugly behavior by those pagans, right? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I just mentioned, made Qurmut one whole month, praying against those killers and murderers, and he was very, very sad, more than anything else. More, he was very sad for those Qurra, those teachers of the Qur'an, more than being sad for anything else, as we mentioned in the Hadith, right? Okay, we mentioned how Sayyidina Abu Bakr anhu compiled the Qur'an, and we mentioned the story of Sayyidina Khuzayma bin Thabit, whose testimony was enough. Then, we stopped at, and we said why the Qur'an was not compiled in one book at the time of the Prophet All these are important topics. Then we stopped at that master copy that Sayyidina Abu Bakr compiled, or commanded to compile, and Sayyidina Zayd executed this command, and they put that copy where? In the house of the Khalifa, Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Then after he passed away, where did they put it? With Sayyidina Umar, the second Khalifa, right? Then, then they kept it because after Sayyidina Umar, they did not choose Sayyidina Uthman right away. It took some time until they had shura and consultation and, you know, like elections. and Right? There was a time of elections. If you study and if you read, I talk about this. Uh, during the lives of the Sahaba series, the lives of the Qurra series in Rani. If you watch that, you will see how there was a type of democratic process to select the, the Khalifa, the Muslim leader. So Islam is not against democracy, guys. You have to be very aware of this, especially when you're going to college, and, and definitely you will face these topics and these discussions. Islam is not against democracy completely. It's not as some crazy, ignorant Muslims who say democracy is kufr or democracy is shirk as Al-Qaeda and those crazy people. This is what, these are some of their like, uh, motos, right? This is some of their motos, some of their words. Even I met someone in Jordan who was telling me, ah, oh, democracy is kufr and he was trying to convince me. But only ignorant people will say such words. A lot of things in democracy are part of the Islamic teachings. Like the shura, the consultation, like electing people who are qualified, like giving people also the right to choose. Right? In Islam, we, we, uh, uh, we cannot have someone and be a dictator on us. I'm not chosen by the, the people, I'm not accepted by the people. As almost every single Arab leader, 
who were put by the by the the West and the colonizations, them and their families, and now they put their children and everyone puts his children, child. These have no relation to Islam in their actions. So Sayyidina Uthman, because it took the his selection took about a week, right? And and also you will learn amazing aspects of of, of uh, Justice and transparency. Transparency. When you learn how they chose, for example, Sayyidina Omar told them. Sayyidina Omar assigned five people to and told the Muslims to choose one from them, or told those people that one of them sh should be the leader. So he nominated, and he put his son and told him. My son cannot be the leader, but let him be, so that if you are Thai, he will choose one. So he will be the judge to choose if if you are Thai in the number. If if uh, you chose, you give three votes to two people, and uh, those two people have equal votes, then he can give his vote to choose the leader. So he did not approve that his own son be be a leader. Now in this 20th century and in America, which is so-called the country of democracy, we have the president's daughter and the president's son-in-law and his relatives, they're working in, the, in, in high positions in the state, right? Even though they're not qualified. And people know they're not qualified, just as himself. <laughs> He's never qualified for, for such position, right? So. Wallahi, when you study Islam, guys, and you study the history of Islam, you will, your head will be in the sky, high in the sky. You will feel proud of this amazing religion that established the, the greatest principles of, of, in politics and in education and all of, the, all of the, the aspects of life. So, what happened? They kept the Mus'haf or the Suhuf, let's call it, Suhuf, the scrolls, because it, must, it was not like compiled and made as a book, but they were equal pieces of parchments, so they call it Suhuf, okay? Suhuf Siddiqiyya, they gave it to who? To Sayyidah Hafsa, Sayyidah Hafsa, the daughter of Sayyidina Umar, the wife of the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they kept it with her. Ten years, ten years of Sayyidina Umar's time, Two years Sayyidina Abu Bakr, ten years Sayyidina Umar, then, so how much is that? Twelve. Who can tell me how many years after the Hijrah is that? Twelve? How many years after the Hijrah? Twenty-two. Right? Because the Prophet ﷺ migrated, spent how many years in Al Medina? Ten. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, two. Sayyidina Umar, 10, so 22. Then Sayyidina Uthman, after two years of his Khilafah, so now 24 years after the Prophet Sallallahu Hijrah, now they needed that copy. Imagine, that master copy, again don't forget, which was taken from where? From where? From the prophetic pieces, if you like, the prophetic parchments means the ones that were written in the time of the Prophet and those were sacred, remember, huh? those were sacred copies, sacred pieces because they're under the watch of the, the revelation, the divine revelation, under the supervision of the divine revelation, even in the writing, even though the Prophet did not read or write, but if the companions or the scribes of the revelation, they would make a mistake, Allah will caution his Prophet even in the writing. They used to write it in the way that is, that is used among them, but we will see that there were some, some letters that are not pronounced, still they were written. And some letters that are pronounced, but it was not written. Like the Ya, for example, Yastahyi, when we have two Ya example. So, then we also said that after the, the scribes write, Rasulullah will ask them to write, to read back, so that he will proofread and he will make sure they wrote what he exactly dictated to them. What 
happened after that? We have to stop here before we move to say what happened after that. We have to get an idea about the Qiraat of the Qur'an so that we understand what the Sahaba did and what Sayyidina Uthman did before that. Is it working? We have to, to see, to get an idea about the Qiraat of the Qur'an then we will see how Sayyiduna Uthman and his committee accommodated those qira'at into that copy that he will make and the six other copies that he will copy from the master copy. So now it's extremely important to understand this, the qira'at, uh, before we move on and before we see how we're gonna we're gonna use uh, how the Sahaba how the Sahaba will will use that master copy. Now it's it's the time for that copy to be used. And as you can see, 20, uh, 12 years, right? Twelve years, fourteen years. They did not need that copy. And this shows you that even though seventy of the Quran passed away and another seventy, it didn't matter for them because it, there is a big number. And they're memorizing, and the Qur'an was like their life. Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar, as in the authentic narration, uh, they visited, uh, I think, Um Ayman, the, the, the babysitter of the Prophet Wasallam. They used to visit her and take care of her, I think, uh, her or, or someone else anyway. And they were, she found them crying so much, Sayyidina Abu Bakr crying so much. Then she said, why are you crying? He said, Wallahi, I'm not crying only for like the, the passing away of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because I know what he moved to is better than what he left. He's, he, he's going to a greater life, right? To a better life. No more uh, sadness, no more persecution, no more worries and concerns about the ummah and da'wah, etc., etc., right? Then she told him, then why are you crying? He said, because the wahi has been cut between the heavens and the earth. The revelation, the connection between the heavens and the earth has been cut by the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they, they realized that holiness and sacredness uh, and, and value of that, of the wahi, of the revelation. And this is why they, it was like their, in the, it was their life. The Quran was their life. They used to teach it to their children and they used to memorize it and write it. It's, and uh, so this is why they, they knew it very well. And uh, we said they did, not, they did not compile it in the time of the Prophet ﷺ in one place and did not make copies because they did not have, they did not have a lot, of, a lot of, uh, of those tools of writing, right? They did not have the paper yet. Right? We mentioned how they used to write on the leaves of trees and the, 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 the shoulder blades of, of animals and the skins of animals, etc. And there were a lot, a lot of Qurra, a lot of Sahaba memorized the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ was still there. And the, the Muslim land was still did not expand so much, so they did not need really a big number, right? So I'm mentioning this so that now you compare and realize why they needed in the time of Sayyidina Uthman, they needed to make copies now. You will see why. Because in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, it was the Arab Peninsula only, right? In the time of Sayyidina Uthman, of course Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Uthman, in the time of Sayyidina Uthman, it reached, as I'm going to show inshallah in the map, Syria, Egypt, Iraq, Iran, and beyond. So it was like this, it became like this. The, the biggest expansion of Islam was in that time, by the way, in the time of Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Uthman, where they conquered a huge land after the Romans and the Persians were trying to finish off the young Muslim states, Muslims with their little number, but with their big and great, with their great belief in their religion, they were able to, to defeat those long-lasting great empires
So the main reliance, this is why it was, it was the, the oral transmission, and this is why some of the scholars, Sayyid al Tanuki, he says, they used to say, don't carry knowledge from a suhaf, a suhufi, nor take the Quran from a mushafi. Don't take knowledge from a suhufi, someone who took his knowledge from books, and, and don't take the Quran from someone who took his recitation from a mushaf only, from a mushafi. Don't take it. What does that mean? You take, you have to take the Quran from, from the scholars who got it from the scholars who got it from the scholars back from our beloved sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we have a hadith. I'm giving you some more, more uh, traditions about, about how their care for the Quran was. Uh, say Imam Ahmad narrates from Sayyidina Ubadah ibn Samit radiyallahu anhu. He said, "Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam yushgal." Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to get busy. And you know, there are many new people coming to Islam. So he used to be busy sometimes. So if a man migrating came, a migrant came to Rasulullah he will send him to, some, to one of us to teach him the Quran. There was only the Quran, guys, right? There was nothing. And the Arabs, did the Arabs have any books? There were no books for the Arabs. That was the first book. They only knew what some poetry, right? And their lineages, right? Their family trees, that's what they knew. Also, another very important point is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa cautioned the Sahaba, as in the hadith narrated by Imam Muslim, told them, don't write anything from me other than the Quran. And if someone wrote anything, from what I said, other than the Quran, erase it. Why? Why is that? He said, don't write anything other than the Quran. What do you think? So that they don't mix it with the Quran. And that was in the beginning, focus, huh? That was in the beginning. And after a while, when they are now realized the, the big difference, huh? the big difference and style of the Qur'an and the difference between the Qur'an, the words of the Creator and the words of the Prophet وسلم, the best creature and they cannot be compared be careful as, as Rasulullah said وسلم, وَفَضْلُ كَلَامِ اللَّهِ عَلَى سَائِرِ الْكَلَامِ وَفَضْلِ اللَّهِ عَلَى سَائِرِ خلق. the preference and the difference between Allah's words and the creature's words is just like the difference between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the creature, the creator and the creature. Is there any comparison? No comparison. So when they realized that they got to know that the Quran has its unique style, then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gave them the permission back to write. And also, some scholars, they understood this hadith to be that anyone who wrote on the same manuscript or the same uh, parchment wrote some Quran and, and some of the words that I was saying erase that. You understand? And that is very possible as well. Like the Prophet وسلم, let's say the Wahi came to him and he's dictating to the Sahaba. Right? And when he is dictating to them some Quran, maybe he said some words, some extra words or some tafsir, let's say. So he told them, if you wrote something other than the Quran, erase it. So this is an extremely important point here, that he wanted وسلم, in those parchments, only the Quran, don't mix it with my words. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah. And the Sahaba wrote every single thing. The whole Quran was written in the time of the Prophet and some verses more than one copy. Some verses were written absolutely more than once in more than one copy. So you will find one ayah in many parchments. Why? Who can tell me why? Yalla guys, I want you to move your to move your brain. More people, more people were writing, right? Many people were writing, not only one person, right? So we will have many parchments, many parchments for many ayat, for most of the ayat. And they, and they used to write even one word, they will write it. One example in Sahih Bukhari, 
from Sayyidina Zayd radiallahu anhu. Sayyidina Zayd bin Thabit, the, the, the master of this field, the field of writing the Quran and compiling the Quran, he said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dictated to me the ayah, لا يستوي القاعدون من المؤمنين والمجاهدون في سبيل الله. Then Ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu anhu, this Sahabi, who, who was blind in his sight, he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, why Allah, if I'm able to, to join you in the struggle and the fight to defend the, the, the Muslim land, I would have done that. But as you know, I'm, I'm blind. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam three words. غَيْرُ أُولِي الضَّرَرُ لَا يَسْتَوِ الْقَاعِدُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ غَيْرُ أُولِي الضَّرَرُ Right? لَا يَسْتَوِ الْقَاعِدُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ غَيْرُ أُولِي الضَّرَرِ وَالْمُجَاهِدُونَ Right? What's the ayah? What's the ayah? Who can read the ayah? لَا يَسْتَوِ الْقَاعِدُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Huh? غَيْرُ أُولِي الضَّرَرِ وَالْمُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Look at this also very important point in the order of the ayat and the order of the words, every single word in every single ayah is put in its place by revelation from Allah, not by selection or opinion of any person, not even the Prophet ﷺ himself. So the ayah first was like this, لا يستوي القاعدون من المؤمنين والمجاهدون في سبيل الله Those believers who were sitting, who did not go and participate in the struggle, in the jihad, they are not equal with who? With who? With the mujahidun, with the strugglers, those who are uh, fighting for the sake of Allah in defense means in defense of their land. They are not equal. And he wrote that. And when Sayyidina Ibn Umm Maktoum came, Allah revealed the exception. Except those who have excuses, who are harmed by some disabilities. So that, those are three words, where did Rasulullah tell him to put it? After Al-Mu'mineen. So the ayah became what? لا يستوي القاعدون من المؤمنين The believers who are, who did not participate in jihad, who are sitting, except those who are harmed by some disabilities, they are not equal with those who struggle and fight for the sake of Allah. So those who have excuses, they're excused, they're exempted. But those who have no excuse, of course they're not equal with those who are going to jihad. Sayyidina Zayd said, the thigh of Rasulullah was on my thigh, like means they were sitting close. And he said it became heavy until I, I thought it is, it is cut, it is cut off. Until I felt my thigh is cut off because of what? The, the heaviness of the revelation. As we mentioned before, the revelation had also a type of, it would make like a physical impact from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And this is the Surah Al-Muzzammir, right? Inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. We're sending to you a heavy speech, right? Not only spiritually, also physically. It was manifested also physically. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And subhanAllah, look at this amazing narration in Sunan Abi Dawood. When Sayyidina Ibn Umm Maktoum came, Rasulullah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said to Zayd after he received the other revelation of those three words. I'm showing you this example that they missed nothing. Even one word, nothing. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we mentioned also before, he would tell him, read what you wrote. اقرأ يا زي. Read what you wrote, O Zayn. So he read, لا يستوي القاعدون من المؤمنين. Then Rasulullah said, غير أولي الضرر. So Sayyidina Zayd, he said, فألحقها. He added that exception to the ayah. And this shows you also, it was very difficult to combine the Quran in the time of the Prophet ﷺ because the order of the revelation is not similar to the order of the surah in the Quran. Not similar to the order of the chapters. 
So imagine, let's say they wrote this surah in one mushaf, they wrote the other surah, this, the next surah, and they, they put it in one mushaf. Now, okay, an ayah will come and Allah will command that this ayah will be put in that surah. Then what do they have? They cannot erase, they cannot like, it's not easy at all, right? This is why they did not compile it, and they did not need to, right? That's one of the reasons. But look at this nice narration here. He said, by, um, by the one who controls my soul, who is saying Sayyidina Zayn, as in this hadith in Musnad Ahmad and others. He said, now, when he's narrating the hadith, he's saying, now I, as if I see the place of that, of that sentence, of those three words, at a crack in the shoulder in, on which I was writing. فَوَاللَّهِ فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِهِ لَكَأَنِّي أَنظُرُ إِلَى مُلْحَقِهَا عِنْدَ صَدْعٍ كَانَ فِي الْكَتِفِ SubhanAllah Look at those amazing memories and um, amazing spiritual experiences that they had. He's writing the revelation that is being revealed from the Creator. So he had what? A shoulder. A shoulder of a camel or shoulder of, of those big animals. So it's a shoulder, shoulder blade, right? Big piece. And in that shoulder there was a crack. So he said, I now when he's narrating that he says, as if now I I see those words that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam added by the revelation to that ayah, as if I see their position in that shoulder, they, I wrote them at a crack in that shoulder. Do you realize what he's talking about? Radiallahu anhu. On, on the other hand, these are three words. On the other hand, when there was a big amount of verses revealed at once, they will write all of them. And the example is narrated by Imam al-Hakim about Surah al-An'am. Surah al-An'am was revealed all together at once. And Rasulullah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our Sayyid Najab said when Surah Al-An'am was revealed, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi started making tasbih. And he said, this Surah has been uh, carried by angels, thousands of angels who blocked the horizon. So as if like this Surah is coming with, with a great honor, with a great like uh, protection, with a great guardianship, with a great celebration, if you like. From the angels sending and revealing this surah, and the narrator said, and they wrote it that night. They did not wait. They did not wait. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is reading. Imagine, Allahu Akbar. Those were those, those were the greatest people. How can how can they sleep without writing this amazing surah, this revelation? Rasulullah is reading. They're gonna write. They're not gonna sleep before they write it. They wrote it all down. As Another narration says in Tabarani from Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar, he said, Nazalat alayya surah al an'am jullata wahida. Surah al an'am was revealed at once. Wa shayya'aha sab'una alfa min al malaika. 70,000 of the angels carried it, came with it. Lahum zajal, they had sound of tasbih and tahmeed. Allah. And that was where? In Mecca, guys, huh? In Mecca. Even in Mecca. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called on the scribes and they wrote it فَكَتَبُوهَا مِنْ لَيْلَتِهِ And they wrote it at that night. SubhanAllah. Now Surah Al-An'am, in our, in our copies in the 20th century with all the advancement in writing and printing and, and everything, how many pages? 20 something, right? 20 something pages. So in that time, look now, look for example at that parchment. Can you put the camera on that parchment on the on the wall, yeah, sister? Yeah. See that parchment, for example, it has Ayatul Kursi. See Ayatul Kursi? Zoom on, on the parchment there. Look, Ayatul Kursi in the Quran is almost how many? Like five lines, right? Six lines in the page, right? When would it be me? I can first see. Yeah. Hey, what? Hey, I'm really zoomed straight. I'm gonna check the height and watch it. 
So, see, see this parchment, this is leather by the way, huh? This is leather. Maybe, I don't think they will write in a smaller writing than that one, right? So, imagine, yani, let's say maybe the page in our time, it will take them at least two, two pieces like this, right? Two parchments like this size, right? So, they did a great effort. And they did it with joy and with, with love and with, with belief and with, with care, right? Because they realized the importance of that, of that book, which is the holy book. And the final book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to humanity. Uh, one more thing before we move to the Qira'at. And this, this should be like the entrance to the Qira'at. Is something called Al-Ard Al-Akhira that we have to be aware of. We know some verses in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will abrogate some verses. He will abrogate some verses. He will change some verses. And this is in Surah Al-Baqarah. مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Whatever ayah we abrogate or change, or whatever ayah we make them forget it, مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ We bring a better than, better, a better one. Don't you know that Allah is able to do everything? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes whatever he likes. And of course, وَعِنْدَهُ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ He has the, the mother of the book, the, the, the main book that does not change in the sacred tablet, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows the Muslims that he meets their needs and he gives them what they need and he changes based on, on what they, what they uh, need. And he shows them that he subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful with them. So he abrogated some ayat. There were some ayat that were few ayat that were abrogated. Now some ayat keep in your mind. They were revealed and they were abrogated in writing and in meaning. Means their meaning and their writing were abrogated means they're not part of the Qur'an anymore. Okay? And, and, and one of those ayat is an ayah about stoning that the Sahaba narrates. Then, another type is some ayat that are still in the Qur'an, but the ruling of those ayat is abrogated and changed by other ayat. Did you get? Did you get that? Now, what happens when uh, every Ramadan as we mentioned in the hadith, every Ramadan, what will Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa do with Sayyidina Jibreel? They will study the Qur'an together. As in the narration, فَيُدَارِسُهُ الْقُرْآنِ يُدَارِسَهُ الْقُرْآنِ They will study the Qur'an together. In another narration, يَعْرِضُ عَلَيْهِ He will read to him. Or يُعَارِضَهُ Means they will read to each other. Who? Sayyidina Jibreel and Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa they will read to each other the Qur'an. Everything that was revealed this year, this past year, they will review it together. Now, when Rasulullah, after the review is done, what will Rasulullah do? Of course, he will narrate to the Sahaba, he will dictate to them, this ayah, take it away. This ayah is obligated by this ayah. This ayah means this, this ayah means that. Right? Obviously. So he's going to narrate Let's say the review of this year, he's going to read to the Sahaba. So every year, he's, what, what, is, what, what do we call this? Update, right? He's updating them, right? Every year, he's updating them. And Sayyidina Jibreel, right, updating him. In the last year, when he passed away, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how many times he reviewed the Quran with him? Twice. And this is why Rasulullah said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Jibreel used to review the Quran with me every year once and this year he did it twice so I think my death is soon. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at this. Look guys, all of this you know is a lesson for us. Allah could have just could have revealed the, uh, the written Quran. Right or no? And could have just put the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put the Quran in the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam without needing Sayyidina Jibreel, without needing to review it every year, without needing to write it and bother themselves and try to find those parchments and stay up late at night and write and collect it, etc, etc, etc. Right or no? But this shows you 
that we have to give we have to give care to the Quran and we have to appreciate the efforts that were made to bring us this greatest book right and also it's a lesson for us that we have to review you have to review the Quran you have to keep reviewing the greatest of, of, of people وسلم, and the greatest of, of, of creatures he used to review the Quran every year with Sayyidina Jibreel so this is a lesson for us guys Wallahi is a big lesson for us <clears throat> so who was there when that al arda al-akhira it's called the final version if you like the final version or the final review al arda al-akhira remember the term that's the term that scholars use in the sciences of the quran al arda al-akhira the, the final review or the final yeah the final review Sayyidina Zayd bin Thabit was of the main Sahaba who witnessed that review. And Sayyidina Ubay, and Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas'ud, and Sayyidina Uthman, remember these names, and Sayyidina Umar, and Sayyidina Abu Bakr, and Sayyidina Ali, and Sayyidina Abu Musa al Ash'ari. Those are the main teachers of the Quran. And now, if you go to the Asaneed, to the Ijazat of any of the Qira'at, you will find those great Sahaba there. Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Ali. Sayyidina Zayd, Sayyidina Ubay, Sayyidina Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, those are the greatest Sahaba that, that were there and they witnessed that final review. In addition to how many Sahaba you think? Huh? They were how many Sahaba by the, by the, the end of the life of the Prophet Anyone has an idea? About 100,000. About 100,000. So imagine how many, how many people memorize the Quran and how many people memorize parts of the Quran I'll give you an example here about something called Tawatur Jam'i Tawatur Jam'i we, we understood that that there are so many companions memorize the entire Quran okay let's say this is the Quran these are the chapters of the Quran okay Let's say these are the chapters of the Quran. How many Sahaba memorized the entire Quran? How many? Many, right? Many Sahaba, right? What about the other Sahaba? Now, now, now millions of Muslims, huh? Millions, okay, millions. Uh, let's say hundreds of thousands memorized the entire Quran in the world. Out of two billion Muslims in the world, or 2.5 we have hundreds of thousands of Muslims memorize the entire Quran right in this city we have about 50 people at least in this area right and this is a small area in one state of the United States so imagine in the and this is a non-Arab non country a non-Muslim country imagine that in the Muslim countries and the Arab countries so there are uh, hundreds of thousands at least Memorize the entire Quran. Now, what about the other Muslims? Suppose this is Surah Al-Fatiha. Okay? How many people memorize Surah Al-Fatiha? More than one billion. Right? More than one billion. The, the little kids, they know Al-Fatiha. What about Qurhu Allah Ahad? We have about maybe two billion who know Qurhu Allah Ahad. So there are parts of the Quran that are memorized by a huge, huge, huge number. A huge number memorize these, a huge number memorize these. So the point is what? This is called Tawatur Jam'i. So the entire Quran is memorized by huge numbers of people, whether as, as a whole or as part. So it, this means, what is the result, guys, of this? The result is, every ayah in the Holy Quran is memorized by millions and millions of people. How can a mistake sneak into this it's impossible so now the Sahaba and this is very important uh, introduction for the Qiraat and for the compilation of Sayyidina Uthman huh? the Sahaba the prominent Sahaba particularly particularly those who worked in the teaching of the Quran and the writing of the Quran they were aware no doubt of the final Review in Arabic, what do we call it? Al-Arba 
الأخيرة. They were aware of it. They knew what has been abrogated and what has not. And they were aware of الأحرف السبعة of the Quran. And in the time of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr, when he copied, he copied the final review. And the Sahaba and Sayyidina Zayd particularly, he was aware of the final review. Let's say, example, example. A man came, we know Sayyidina Zayd he, uh, and Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Sayyidina Abu Bakr told them, stand at the door of the masjid and ask people, anyone who has parchments that were, that were written in the presence of Rasulullah let him bring it and bring two witnesses. Let's say someone came and said, he brought the eye. And there's a narration, by the way, that one of the Sahaba, he brought the eye about stoning and he said here you go I have witnesses this was written in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa what will Sayyidina Zayd say what will Sayyidina Uthman say no 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 this has been abrogated Rasulullah said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this is not part of the Quran anymore it was one time now it's not anymore so we're not gonna take it you understand so the Sahaba were aware of the final review. They did not put anything that was abrogated, anything that was not part of the final review of the Quran. Is that clear? Clear, guys? Any questions so far? Is it clear? Believe me, believe me, if you, if you search the internet 10 days, you will not find these points, particularly in English. You will not find them. On the contrary, you will find some, some big mistakes. Some big mistakes that one of the very famous, very famous, I'll give you an example of, of the disasters that I found online. One of the, of the very famous uh, scholars in the Arab world, he has millions of followers on, on Twitter. Imagine, he said, when they were combining the Quran, they missed Surah At-Tawbah. And they didn't find it except with one person. Can you hear that? They, he said they missed what? Surah At-Tawbah. Surah At-Tawbah. More than 20 pages. Surah At-Tawbah. They, they missed Surah At-Tawbah. And it was written only with one person. What is the narration that we have? The last two ayat of Surah At-Tawbah. Right? And we mentioned the story in detail. Like few lines. He made it hundreds of lines. Surah At-Tawbah. Inna lillahi wa inna rajim. That's one example. Another example came, you know, I put this on Facebook because I got upset with this, to draw people's attention. So don't take just from any person. So, the other thing that the Sahaba were aware of, and, and now it will be clear in, in the compilation of Sayyidina Uthman and what and how he's gonna accommodate that is Al Ahruf al Sabah. What is Al Ahruf al Sabah? Something the scholars disagreed about. And again, I couldn't find a single person on YouTube in English, a single scholar who said the right thing about this. And very famous scholars who has thousands of followers. Unfortunately, they did not even they did not even give that they did not even say that there is another opinion at least rather than saying the right opinion. Briefly, al ahruf al sabha is the foundation of the qiraat that we have today. Is the foundation of the qiraat that we have today. Ahruf means awjo. Ahruf means and we start with the hadith of our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where Sayyidina Jibreel came and told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah commands you to recite the Quran ala harf to recite the Quran ala ala harf in Sahih Muslim that Jibreel came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, Allah commands you أن تقرئ أمتك القرآن على حرف 
that Allah commands you to recite the Quran to your Ummah in one way, ala harf, in one way, in one style. Look at the merciful Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What did he say? He said, "As'alullah mu'afatahu wa maghfiratah." I ask Allah for His pardon and forgiveness. Inna ummati la tutiqu dalik. My ummah cannot bear that. My ummah cannot bear that. It's difficult for my ummah. Why? Who knows why? Because the Arabs, just like now, there were many tribes, and every tribe has its own dialect. And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam knew that. And most of the Arabs are illiterate. As Allah said in the Quran, He's the one who sent to the people who are unlettered, who didn't read or write, a, a messenger from among themselves. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with, with his mercy and love and care for the ummah, what did he say? I ask Allah for his pardon and forgiveness. My ummah cannot bear that. Cannot bear just that all the Arabs has to read in one style. Okay, which style? Let's say the style of Quraysh. It will be very difficult. Do you understand? Just like now you want all Americans to speak British English. Huh? Will that be easy? You tell me guys. Will that be easy? It won't be easy because you don't know. You don't know many words in, in British English, how they say it, right? And if you say it, some British, they see you, they will, they will laugh at you and vice versa, right? And we are now in the, not in the age of technology and knowledge and education and you can learn British easily, right? Right or no, guys? Still, this is your own dialect. This is what happened. Our beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told, he asked for permission from Allah, huh? permission from Allah to give more allowance that the Quran be recited in more than one half, more than one way. So he said, well, read it in two ways. Read it ala harfayn. Then he said, As'alullaha ma'afatahu maghfiratahu inna ummati la tutiqu dhal. He asked him again. He said, I ask Allah for his pardon and forgiveness. My ummah cannot bear that. And he told him the third time. The fourth time he said, Allah commands you to recite. Who can remind me? What does this remind you of? This review this request from the Prophet ﷺ to Allah to make it easier for the Ummah. What does it huh? The Salah, right? When Rasul, see at this amazing Prophet ﷺ. See at this merciful Prophet. Bil Mu'mineena Raufa Rahim who is very kind and merciful with the believers ﷺ. Asking Allah to make it easier for his Ummah. Then his, his Ummah comes now and they don't care about his Sunnah, they don't care about his La Hawla Wa La So then Allah said, Sayyidina Jubil said, Allah commands you to read the Qur'an to your Ummah in seven ahruf. Seven ways. Not seven qira'at, huh? Seven qira'at. The qira'at different from the seven ahruf. The qira'at, take this summary, the summary. The qira'at that we have today, which is the ten qira'at, are the result, the result of those seven ahruf. Okay? They are the result of those, of those seven ways. Then he said, فَأَيَّمَا حَرْفٍ قَرَأُوا عَلَيْهِ فَقَدْ أَصَابُوا Then if they read of any, with, with any of these ways, they're right, they're right. If they read with any of those ways, they're right. That's the first hadith that shows you the seven ahruf. Another hadith from Sayyidina Ubay bin Ka'b رضي الله عنه he said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met Jibreel at Ahjar al-Marwa. And he said, Jibreel said, or Rasulullah said, I have been sent to an ummah who are, who is illiterate. An ummah that's illiterate. Among them there is an old man, an old woman, and children. So he's asking what? He's asking for allowance to read the Qur'an in more than one way. So he said, then let them recite the Qur'an in seven ahraf. Let them recite the Qur'an in seven, in seven ahraf. (laughs) 
Imam Ahmad narrates also that one of the Sahaba was reading one of the ayat of the Quran. Then Sayyidina Amr said to him, Amr ibn al-As said to him, No, it's like this. It's not as you it's not the way you're reading it. But it is this way. Then he came to the Prophet and told him, Ya Rasulullah, he's reading in a different way. Look also ha huh? the oral transmission. Sahaba are aware what's going on. Someone read in a different way, right away. Where you got that from? Where you got that from? So he, they went to the Prophet. Again, see, see why they did not need to combine it? The Prophet is there. Someone read in a different way. Okay, let's go to the Prophet. Let's go to the source. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he said, the Quran was revealed in seven ahruf. If you read in any of those ahruf, then you are right. So don't argument among yourselves. Don't be divided among yourselves. That's what he said. Fala tamara. Don't start doubting and argumenting about it. Don't start doubting and arguing about it. You got it? There are many examples. I'll finish with one last example from Sayyidina. From Sayyidina. Uh, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. Many examples. We have many examples about that. Imam Bukhari narrates from Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Let me add one more time. One more hadith. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud that he heard a man reading an ayah. That he heard the Prophet sallallahu reading it in a different way. So he, he said, فَأَخَدْتُ بِيَدِي I took him by hand. Come here. And I took him to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he said when... Both of them read to him. He said, both of you are right. Then he said, those who were before you were destroyed because of their differences and divisions. So our disaster is not the differences. Our disaster, as I said many times, is how to deal with these differences. And the biggest disaster is when we have ignorant people. And the worst disaster when we have ignorant scholars or sheikhs who don't explain these differences to people, then the people will fight and will make takfir against each other. As we see now in, in many places. Uh, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, his, his hadith is the most quoted in this regard, where he heard Hakim bin Hisham or Hakim bin Hizam reading Surah Al-Furqan in a different way than the way he got it from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what did he do? Sayyidina Umar Radiallahu Anhu of course got the Quran from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he heard Hisham bin Hakim uh, reading Surah Al-Furqan and he was in his Salah and Sayyidina Umar he said I held myself I wanted to jump on him during Salah and take him but I held myself he said I held myself until he's over once he's over I caught him I held him and I took him to the where, what are you reading how are you reading this way he said Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught me this way again here extremely important point not every tribe or every person from any tribe he can read in the way he likes no 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 he has to hear it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You understand? No one can say, oh, well, in our tribe they read this word this way, so I'm going to read it this way. No, 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 no. It's not by this. It's again oral transmission. You have to hear it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And these hadith are only examples to show you this. So he said, I heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this way. He said, I also heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He did not read it this way. He said, okay, come. He pulled him. <laughs> he pulled him from his collar to the Prophet The first thing Rasulullah sallallahu when he saw them, he said, Arsilhu ya Umar, leave him, O Umar. <laughs> He's holding him. Leave him, O Umar. He was strict. Not harsh. He was strict. Strict. He said, read, O Omar, he read. He said, this is how it was revealed. He said, read, O Hisham, he read. He said, this is how it was revealed. 
So he approved both of them and he said, read whatever, read in the way that Allah makes easy for you. اقرأ ما تيسر منه Read in the way that Allah makes easy for you. So these are the many narrations that show you this is more, more than enough. There are more examples. This is more than enough that shows us the Quran was revealed in more than one way. The first reason and the main reason is what? I'm going to ask you about this, huh? The first reason and the main wisdom or the main reason for the different ahraf or qiraat is what? Say it. What is it? Huh? Why? Why Allah revealed it? Why the Prophet ﷺ asked for it? To make it easier for the Ummah who used to recite, who used to have many dialects. That is the first reason. The other reason, and subhanAllah, always when Rasulullah ﷺ asks for something, Allah gives him more. So he asked just for facilitation or allowance just to make it easier for some people. Allah gave him more. What did he give him more in this regard? He gave him not only allowance in some dialects, he also gave him some other readings for some words, huh? some words, no more than 40, no more than 40 words. To be read in more than one way, other than the dialects, so that it gives more than one meaning, but not contradictory meanings. One more time. And here also some scholars, they mix, they say, oh, Qiraat is about dialect. No, ya akhi. No, ya akhi. Qiraat is not only about dialects. It's basically about dialects, but not only about dialects. So Allah gave the Prophet ﷺ not only facilitation or allowance or permittance to recite in more than one dialect but also gave him some words to be read in more than one way in order to give richness to the Quranic text without giving any contradiction between those different readings of those words got it? so by this we have how many types of the of the Qira'at, how many types? Two types. The first type is what? Dialects. A word is read in more than one, more than one dialect. Wabbuha, that's called Fatah. Buha, Fatah. Wabbuha, that's called Taqleed. Or Imala Surah. Wabbuhi, that's called Imala Kubra. Wabbuha, Wabbuha, Wabbuhi. Al-Mu'minun, Al-Mu'minun, Sha, Shay, Sha, Sha, Ibrahim, Ibrahim, Jibreel, Jibra'il, Arjih, Arjihi, Arjihu, Arjihi. All these what? Dialects. Do not change the meaning in any way. That's type number one. Type number two, and we're going to finish with it, is what? Is يَعْمَلُونَ تَعْمَلُونَ For example, وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah is fully knowledgeable of what you do. بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ And وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ Fully knowledgeable of what they do. And the meaning, he is fully knowledgeable of what you do and of what they do. Got it? Maliki Yawmiddin and Maliki Yawmiddin. He is the owner of the Day of Judgment and he is the king and the ruler of the Day of Judgment and the master of the Day of Judgment. Can you see? وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِظَنِينَ And وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِظَنِينَ بِظَنِينَ means he is not, not, he is not miserly on the Quran. He is not going to keep anything of the Quran. He's going to uh, transfer and, and, and dictate the whole Quran. He's not going to hide anything. وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِظَنِينَ And وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِظَنِينَ بِظَنِينَ means he's not accused. Means he's trustworthy. So all of those multiple diverse meanings are never contradictory. But they're like 
synonyms or meanings that support one another and gives richness to the Quranic text. And this is one of the miracles of the Quran. That this word is written in one way, but it can be read in more than, more than one non-contradictory way. Is this clear? These are the qiraat. Then if there are seven ahruf, then why we have ten qiraat? If we have seven ahruf, then why we have ten qiraat? And how did, this, how did the Quranic text accommodate those seven ahruf? And how did Sayyidina Uthman include those qiraat? In Surah Al-Hadith, for example, All the qiraat except for Ibn Amir and Nafi' and Abu Ja'far. Three of the ten qiraat, three of the ten qiraat means six of the narrators. They read it, وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ الْغَنِيُّ الْحَمِيلُ how now in this text will they write huwa or will or they will write it without huwa? These are the questions that we will answer in the next time, inshallah. Any questions?